Chapter One of Memory How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. Memory How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 1. Memory, Its Importance It needs very little argument to convince the average thinking person of the great importance of memory, although even then very few begin to realize just how important is the function of the mind that has to do with the retention of mental impressions. The first thought of the average person when he is asked to consider the importance of memory is its use in the affairs of everyday life, along developed and cultivated lines, as contrasted with the lesser degrees of its development. In short, one generally thinks of memory in its phase of a good memory, as contrasted with the opposite phase of a poor memory. But there is a much broader and fuller meaning of the term than that of even this important phase. It is true that the success of the individual in his everyday business, profession, trade, or other occupation depends very materially upon the possession of a good memory. His value in any walk in life depends to a great extent upon the degree of memory he may have developed. His memory of faces, names, facts, events, circumstances, and other things concerning his everyday work is the measure of his ability to accomplish his task. And in the social intercourse of men and women, the possession of a retentive memory, well stocked with available facts, renders its possessor a desirable member of society. And in the higher activities of thought, the memory comes as an invaluable aid to the individual in marshalling the bits and sections of knowledge he may have acquired and passing them in review before his cognitive faculties thus does the soul review its mental possessions as alexander smith has said a man's real possession is his memory in nothing else is he rich in nothing else is he poor richter has said memory is the only paradise from which we cannot be driven away grant but memory to us and we can lose nothing by death. Lactantius says, Memory tempers prosperity, mitigates adversity, controls youth, and delights old age. But even the above phases of memory represent but a small segment of its complete circle. Memory is more than a good memory. It is the means whereby we perform the largest share of our mental work. As Bacon has said, all knowledge is but remembrance. And Emerson, memory is a primary and fundamental faculty, without which none other can work. The cement, the bitumen, the matrix in which the other faculties are embedded. Without it, all life and thought were an unrelated succession. And Burke, there is no faculty of the mind which can bring its energy into effect unless the memory be stored with ideas for it to look upon. And Basile, memory is the cabinet of imagination, the treasury of reason, the registry of conscience, and the council chamber of thought. Kant pronounced memory to be the most wonderful of the faculties. K., one of the best authorities on the subject, has said regarding it, Unless the mind possessed the power of treasuring up and recalling its past experiences, no knowledge of any kind could be acquired. If every sensation, thought, or emotion passed entirely from the mind the moment it ceased to be present, then it would be as if it had not been, and it could not be recognized or named should it happen to return. Such an one would be not only without knowledge, without experience gathered from the past, but without purpose, aim, or plan regarding the future, 
for these imply knowledge and require memory. Even voluntary motion, or motion for a purpose, could have no existence without memory, for memory is involved in every purpose. Not only the learning of the scholar, but the inspiration of the poet, the genius of the painter, the heroism of the warrior, all depend upon memory. Nay, even consciousness itself could have no existence without memory, for every act of consciousness involves a change from a past state to a present, and did the past state vanish the moment it was past, there could be no consciousness of change. Memory, therefore, must be said to be involved in all conscious existence, a property of every conscious being. In the building of character and individuality, the memory plays an important part, for upon the strength of the impressions received, and the firmness with which they are retained, depends the fiber of character and individuality. Our experiences are indeed the stepping stones to greater attainments, and at the same time our guides and protectors from danger. If the memory serves us well in this respect, we are saved the pain of repeating the mistakes of the past, and may also profit by remembering and thus avoiding the mistakes of others. As Beatty says, when memory is preternaturally defective, experience and knowledge will be deficient in proportion, and imprudent conduct and absurd opinion are the necessary consequence. Bain says, A character retaining a feeble hold of bitter experience, or genuine delight, and unable to revive afterwards the impression of the time, is in reality the victim of an intellectual weakness under the guise of a moral weakness. To have constantly before us an estimate of the things that affect us, true to the reality, is one precious condition for having our will always stimulated with an accurate reference to our happiness. The thoroughly educated man, in this respect, is that he can carry with him at all times the exact estimate of what he has enjoyed or suffered from every object that has ever affected him, and in case of encounter can present to the enemy as strong a front as if he were under the genuine impression. A full and accurate memory, for pleasure or for pain, is the intellectual basis both of prudence as regards self and sympathy as regards others. So we see that the cultivation of the memory is far more than the cultivation and development of a single mental faculty. It is the cultivation and development of our entire mental being, the development of our selves. To many persons, the words memory, recollection, and remembrance have the same meaning, but there is a great difference in the exact shade of meaning of each term. The student of this book should make the distinction between the terms, for by so doing he will be better able to grasp the various points of advice and instruction herein given. Let us examine these terms. Locke, in his celebrated work, the essay concerning human understanding has clearly stated the difference between the meaning of these several terms he says memory is the power to revive again in our minds those ideas which after imprinting have disappeared or have been laid aside out of sight when an idea again recurs without the operation of the like object on the external sensory it is remembrance. If it be sought after by the mind, and with pain and endeavor found, and brought again into view, it is recollection. Fuller says, commenting on this, memory is the power of reproducing in the mind former impressions, or percepts. Remembrance and recollection are the exercise of that power the former being involuntary or spontaneous, the latter volitional. We remember because we cannot help it, but we recollect only through positive effort. 
the act of remembering taken by itself is involuntary in other words when the mind remembers without having tried to remember it acts spontaneously thus it may be said in the narrow contrasted sense of the two terms that we remember by chance but recollect by intention and if the endeavor be successful that which is reproduced becomes by the very effort to bring it forth more firmly entrenched in the mind than ever but the new psychology makes a little different distinction from that of locke as given above it uses the word memory not only in his sense of the power to retrieve etc but also in the sense of the activities of the mind which tend to receive and store away the various impressions of the senses and the ideas conceived by the mind to the end that they may be reproduced voluntarily or involuntarily thereafter the distinction between remembrance and recollection as made by locke is adopted as correct by the new psychology it has long been recognized that the memory in all of its phases is capable of development culture training and guidance through intelligent exercise like any other faculty of the mind or physical part muscle or limb it may be improved and strengthened but until recent years the entire efforts of these memory developers were directed to the strengthening of that phase of the memory known as recollection which you will remember locke defined as an idea or impression sought after by the mind and with pain and endeavor found and brought again into view the new psychology goes much further than this while pointing out the most improved and scientific methods for recollecting the impressions and ideas of the memory it also instructs the student in the use of the proper methods whereby the memory may be stored with clear and distinct impressions which will thereafter flow naturally and involuntarily into the field of consciousness when the mind is thinking upon the associated subject or line of thought and which may also be recollected by a voluntary effort with far less expenditure of energy than under the old methods and systems you will see this idea carried out in detail as we progress with the various stages of the subject in this work you will see that the first thing to do is to find something to remember then to impress that thing clearly and distinctly upon the receptive tablets of the memory then to exercise the remembrance in the direction of bringing out the stored away facts of the memory then to acquire the scientific methods of recollecting special items of memory that may be necessary at some special time this is the natural method in memory cultivation as opposed to the artificial systems that you will find mentioned in another chapter it is not only development of the memory but also development of the mind itself in several of its regions and phases of activity it is not merely a method of recollecting but also a method of correct seeing thinking and remembering this method recognizes the truth of the verse of the poet pope who said remembrance and reflection how allied what thin partition sense from thought divide End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 2 Cultivation of the Memory This book is written with the fundamental intention and idea of pointing out a rational and workable method whereby the memory may be developed, trained, and cultivated. Many persons seem to be under the impression that memories are bestowed by nature, in a fixed degree or possibilities, and that little more can be done for them. In short, that memories are born, not made. 
but the fallacy of any such idea is demonstrated by the investigations and experiments of all the leading authorities as well as by the results obtained by persons who have developed and cultivated their own memories by individual effort without the assistance of an instructor but all such improvement to be real must be along certain natural lines and in accordance with the well-established laws of psychology instead of along artificial lines and in defiance of psychological principles cultivation of the memory is a far different thing from trick memory or feats of mental ledger domain if the term is permissible k says that the memory is capable of indefinite improvement there can be no manner of doubt but with regard to the means by which this improvement is to be effected mankind are still greatly in ignorance dr noah porter says the natural as opposed to the artificial memory depends on the relations of sense and the relations of thought the spontaneous memory of the eye and the ear availing itself of the obvious conjunctions of objects which are furnished by space and time and the rational memory of those higher combinations which the rational faculties superinduce upon those lower the artificial memory proposes to substitute for the natural and necessary relations under which all objects must present and arrange themselves an entirely new set of relations that are purely arbitrary and mechanical which excite little or no other interest than that they are to aid us in remembering it follows that if the mind tasks itself to the special effort of considering objects under these artificial relations it will give less attention to those which have a direct and legitimate interest for itself granville says the defects of most methods which have been devised and employed for improving the memory lies in the fact that while they serve to impress particular subjects on the mind they do not render the memory as a whole ready or attentive fuller says surely an art of memory may be made more destructive to natural memory than spectacles are to eyes these opinions of the best authorities might be multiplied indefinitely the consensus of the best opinion is decidedly against the artificial systems and in favor of the natural ones natural systems of memory culture are based upon the fundamental conception so well expressed by helvetius several centuries ago when he said the extent of the memory depends first on the daily use we make of it secondly upon the attention with which we consider the objects we would impress upon it and thirdly upon the order in which we range our ideas this then is the list of the three essentials in the cultivation of the memory one use and exercise review and practice two attention and interest and three intelligent association you will find that in the several chapters of this book dealing with the various phases of memory we urge first last and all the time the importance of the use and employment of the memory in the way of employment exercise practice and review work like any other mental faculty or physical function the memory will tend to atrophy by disuse and increase strengthen and develop by rational exercise and employment within the bounds of moderation you develop a muscle by exercise you train any special faculty of the mind in the same way and you must pursue the same method in the case of the memory if you would develop it nature's laws are constant and bear a close analogy to each other you will also notice the great stress that we lay upon the use of the faculty of attention accompanied by interest by attention you acquire the impressions that you file away in your mental record file of memory and the degree of attention regulates the depth clearness and strength of the impression without a good record you cannot expect to obtain a good reproduction of it 
a poor phonographic record results in a poor reproduction and the rule applies in the case of the memory as well you will also notice that we explain the laws of association and the principles which govern the subject as well as the methods whereby the proper associations may be made every association that you weld to an idea or an impression serves as a cross-reference in the index whereby the thing is found by remembrance or recollection when it is needed we call your attention to the fact that one's entire education depends for its efficiency upon this law of association it is a most important feature in the rational cultivation of the memory while at the same time being the bane of the artificial systems natural associations educate while artificial ones tend to weaken the powers of the mind if carried to any great length there is no royal road to memory the cultivation of the memory depends upon the practice along certain scientific lines according to well-established psychological laws those who hope for a sure shortcut will be disappointed for none such exists as halleck says the student ought not to be disappointed to find that memory is no exception to the rule of improvement by proper methodical and long continued exercise there is no royal road no short cut to the improvement of either mind or muscle but the student who follows the rules which psychology has laid down may know that he is walking in the shortest path and not wandering aimlessly about using these rules he will advance much faster than those without chart compass or pilot he will find monomics of extremely limited use improvement comes by orderly steps methods that dazzle at first sight never give solid results the student is urged to pay attention to what we have to say in other chapters of the book upon the subjects of attention and association it is not necessary to state here the particulars that we mention there the cultivation of the attention is a prerequisite for good memory and deficiency in this respect means deficiency not only in the field of memory but also in the general field of mental work in all branches of the new psychology there is found a constant repetition of the injunction to cultivate the faculty of attention and concentration halleck says haziness of perception lies at the root of many a bad memory if perception is definite the first step has been taken toward ensuring a good memory if the first impression is vivid its effect upon the brain cells is more lasting all persons ought to practice their visualizing power this will react upon perception and make it more definite visualizing will also form a brain habit of remembering things pictorially and hence more exactly the subject of association must also receive its proper share of attention for it is by means of association that the stored away records of the memory may be recovered or recollected as blackie says nothing helps the mind so much as order and classification classes are few individuals many to know the class well is to know what is most essential in the character of the individual and what burdens the memory least to retain and as halleck says regarding the subject of association by relation whenever we can discover any relation between facts it is far easier to remember them the intelligent law of memory may be summed up in these words endeavor to link by some thought relation each new mental acquisition to an old one bind new facts to other facts by relations of similarity cause and effect whole and part or by any logical relation and we shall find that when an idea occurs to us a host of related ideas will flow into the mind if we wish to prepare a speech or write an article on any subject 
pertinent illustrations will suggest themselves. The person whose memory is merely contiguous will wonder how we think of them. In your study for the cultivation of the memory, along the lines laid down in this book, you have read the first chapter thereof, and have informed yourself thoroughly regarding the importance of the memory to the individual, and what a large part it plays in the entire work of the mind. Now carefully read the third chapter, and acquaint yourself with the possibilities in the direction of cultivating the memory to a high degree, as evidenced by the instances related of the extreme cases of development noted therein. Then study the chapter on memory systems, and realize that the only true method is the natural method, which requires work, patience, and practice. Then make up your mind that you will follow this plan as far as it will take you. Then acquaint yourself with the secret of memory, the subconscious region of the mind, in which the records of memory are kept, stored away, and indexed, and in which the little mental office boys are busily at work. This will give you the key to the method. Then take up the two chapters on attention and association, respectively, and acquaint yourself with these important principles. Then study the chapter on the phases of memory, and take mental stock of yourself, determining in which phase of memory you are strongest, and in which you need development. Then read the two chapters on training the eye and ear, respectively. You need this instruction. Then read over the several chapters on the training of the special phases of the memory, whether you need them or not. You may find something of importance in them. Then read the concluding chapter, which gives you some general advice and parting instruction. Then return to the chapters dealing with the particular phases of memory in which you have decided to develop yourself, studying the details of the instruction carefully until you know every point of it. Then, most important of all, get to work. Chapter 3 The of Rest memory. is a Matter How of to Practice, develop, practice, practice and use Practice, it. and Rehearsal. This LibriVox recording is Go in the public domain. Go back to the chapters from time to time. Memory, and How refresh to develop, your mind train, regarding and use the details. By William Walker Atkinson. Reread each chapter at chapter intervals. Chapter 3 Make the book Celebrated your own cases in of every memory. sense of the word by absorbing its contents. In order that the student may appreciate the marvelous extent End of, of chapter development two. possible to the memory, we have thought it advisable to mention a number of celebrated cases, past and present. In so doing, we have no desire to hold up these cases as worthy of imitation, for they are exceptional and not necessary in everyday life. We mention them merely to show to what wonderful extent development along these lines is possible. In India, in the past, the sacred books were committed to memory, and handed down from teacher to student for ages. And even today it is no uncommon thing for the student to be able to repeat, word for word, some voluminous religious work equal in extent to the New Testament. Max Muller states that the entire text and glossary of Panini's Sanskrit grammar, equal in extent to the entire Bible, were handed down orally for several centuries before being committed to writing. There are Brahmins today who have committed to memory, and who can repeat at will, the entire collection of religious poems known as the Mahabharata, consisting of over 300,000 slokas, or verses. Leland states that the Slavonian minstrels of the present day have by heart, with remarkable accuracy, immensely long epic poems. I have found the same among Algonquin Indians, whose sagas, or mythic legends, are interminable, and yet are committed word by word accurately. I have heard in England of a lady ninety years of age whose memory was miraculous, and of which extraordinary instances are narrated by her friends. She attributed it to the fact that when young, she had been made to learn a verse from the Bible every day, and then constantly review it. 
as her memory improved she learned more the result being that in the end she could repeat from memory any verse or chapter called for in the whole scripture it is related that mithridates the ancient warrior king knew the name of every soldier in his great army and conversed fluently in twenty-two dialects pliny relates that carmides could repeat the contents of every book in his large library hortensius the roman orator had a remarkable memory which enabled him to retain and recollect the exact words of his opponent's argument without making a single notation on a wager he attended a great auction sale which lasted over an entire day and then called off in their proper order every object sold the name of its purchaser and the price thereof seneca is said to have acquired the ability to memorize several thousand proper names and to repeat them in the order in which they had been given him and also to reverse the order and call off the list backward he also accomplished the feat of listening to several hundred persons each of whom gave him a verse memorizing the same as they proceeded and then repeating them word for word in the exact order of their delivery and then reversing the process with complete success eusebius stated that only the memory of esdras saved the hebrew scriptures to the world for when the chaldeans destroyed the manuscripts esdras was able to repeat them word by word to the scribes who then reproduced them the mohammedan scholars are able to repeat the entire text of the koran letter perfect scaliger committed the entire text of the iliad and the odyssey in three weeks ben jonson is said to have been able to repeat all of his own works from memory with the greatest ease bulwer could repeat the odes of horace from memory pascal could repeat the entire bible from beginning to end as well as being able to recall any given paragraph verse line or chapter lander is said to have read a book but once when he would dispose of it having impressed it upon his memory to be recalled years after if necessary byron could recite all of his own poems buffon could repeat his works from beginning to end bryant possessed the same ability to repeat his own works bishop saunderson could repeat the greater part of juvenal and persius all of tully and all of horace fedosofa a russian peasant could repeat over twenty-five thousand poems folk songs legends fairy tales war stories etc when she was over seventy years of age the celebrated blind alec an aged scottish beggar could repeat any verse in the bible called for as well as the entire text of all the chapters and books the newspapers a few years ago contained the accounts of a man named clark who lived in new york city he is said to have been able to give the exact presidential vote in each state of the union since the first election he could give the population in every town of any size in the world either present or in the past providing there was a record of the same he could quote from shakespeare for hours at a time beginning at any given point in any play he could recite the entire text of the iliad in the original greek the historical case of the unnamed dutchman is known to all students of memory this man is said to have been able to take up a fresh newspaper to read it all through including the advertisements and then to repeat its contents word for word from beginning to end on one occasion he is said to have heaped wonder upon wonder by repeating the contents of the paper backward beginning with the last word and ending with the first lyon the english actor is said to have duplicated this feat using a large london paper and including the market quotations reports of the debates in parliament the railroad timetables and the advertisements a london waiter is said to have performed a similar feat on a wager 
he memorizing and correctly repeating the contents of an eight-page paper. One of the most remarkable instances of extraordinary memory known to history is that of the child Christian Meineken. When less than four years of age, he could repeat the entire Bible, two hundred hymns, five thousand Latin words, and much ecclesiastical history, theory, dogmas, arguments, and an encyclopedic quantity of theological literature. He is said to have practically retained every word that was read to him. His case was abnormal, and he died at an early age. John Stuart Mill is said to have acquired a fair knowledge of Greek at the age of three years, and to have memorized Hume, Gibbon, and other historians at the age of eight. Shortly after, he mastered and memorized Herodotus, Xenophon, some of Socrates, and six of Plato's dialogues. Richard Porson is said to have memorized the entire text of Homer, Horace, Cicero, Virgil, Livy, Shakespeare, Milton, and Gibbon. He is said to have been able to memorize any ordinary novel at one careful reading, and to have several times performed the feat of memorizing the entire contents of some English monthly review. De Rossi was able to perform the feat of repeating a hundred lines from any of the four great Italian poets, provided he was given a line at random from their works, his hundred lines following immediately after the given line. Of course, this feat required the memorizing of the entire works of those poets, and the ability to take up the repetition from any given point, the latter feature being as remarkable as the former. There have been cases of printers being able to repeat, word for word, books of which they had set the type. Professor Lawson was able to teach his classes of the scriptures without referring to the book. He claimed that if the entire stock of Bibles were to be destroyed, he could restore the book entire from his memory. Reverend Thomas Fuller is said to have been able to walk down a long London street, reading the names of the signs on both sides, then recalling them in the order in which they had been seen, and then by reversing the order. There are many cases on record of persons who memorized the words of every known tongue of civilization, as well as a great number of dialects, languages, and tongues of savage races. Bossuet had memorized the entire Bible, and Homer, Horace, and Virgil beside. Niebuhr, the historian, was once employed in a government office, the records of which were destroyed. He, thereupon, restored the entire contents of the book of records which he had written, all from his memory. Asa Gray knew the names of ten thousand plants. Milton had a vocabulary of twenty thousand words, and Shakespeare one of twenty-five thousand. Cuvier and Agassiz are said to have memorized lists of several thousand species and varieties of animals. Magliobici, the librarian of Florence, is said to have known the location of every volume in the large library of which he was in charge, and the complete list of works along certain lines in all the other great libraries. He once claimed that he was able to repeat titles of over a half million of books in many languages and upon many subjects. In nearly every walk of life are to be found persons with memories wonderfully developed along the lines of their particular occupation. Librarians possess this faculty to an unusual degree. Skilled workers in the finer lines of manufacture also manifest a wonderful memory for the tiny parts of the manufactured article, etc. Bank officers have a wonderful memory for names and faces. Some lawyers are able to recall cases quoted in the authorities, years after they have read them. Perhaps the most common, and yet the most remarkable, instances of memorizing in one's daily work is to be found in the cases of the theatrical profession. 
in some cases members of stock company must not only be able to repeat the lines of the play they are engaged in acting at the time but also the one that they are rehearsing for the following week and possibly the one for the second week and in repertoire companies the actors are required to be letter perfect in a dozen or more plays surely a wonderful feat and yet one so common that no notice is given to it in some of the celebrated cases the degree of recollection manifested is undoubtedly abnormal but in the majority of the cases it may be seen that the result has been obtained only by the use of natural methods and persistent exercise that wonderful memories may be acquired by anyone who will devote to the task patience time and work is a fact generally acknowledged by all students of the subject it is not a gift but something to be won by effort and work along scientific lines End of chapter 3。Please support me with a like and a subscription. Thank you。If you wish to buy this book as a gift to one of your loved ones, you will find the order link in the description。